I never thought people would be punished to the degree that they are today for saying what they think. It's been a disgusting thing to see people, rather than garner wisdom and share it with younger people, destroy the reputations of the youth for mm -hmm. their own gain. I think it's more difficult to be Gen Z than to be some of the generations that went through some crazy stuff. I think it's more difficult to have so little meaning in your life. And, so and so many choices. I completely and utterly lost my feminine energy as soon as I became a single mother because I believe that feminine energy very much comes from a place of feeling protected. But there, there absolutely is an aspect of, and this can go for any race, any group, of I am inherently a victim and I inherently deserve what I am being given and what I am getting. I've definitely seen this with a lot of my male friends who have worked their butts off to get into industries, to be fighter pilots, to uh, work their way up the office, and to see women being given those positions simply because they are women. In a way, I almost think it's anti-feminist. I think that, you know, when we first started taking the birth control pill in the 60s, we never talked about oh, what the goodness. consequences of that was for women. We've gone down this idea that young people can take hormones and that it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. It's not okay. You faced that voluntarily. If you face it involuntarily, it's very traumatizing. But if you face it voluntarily, you can deal with it. And so that's why we have to look at this voluntarily. It's a lot easier wow. on you to look at it volunt voluntarily. You hide from it, you try not to see it, and then it happens, that's when you're traumatized. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Tammy. Nice to have you here with me. Really happy to be here. It was chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> well, how long, how long ago did we decide we were going to do this? It was months ago. Uh, and we've tried, I think, three times. Yeah. And, and now we've been successful. It had to be at the beginning of the year. And I had to take a water plane this morning, Indiana Jones style, <laughs> just to make it to this interview. So I it's a big deal. It. Yeah, I appreciate it. And I'm only here for like another day or two. So mm -hmm. we had to get this done, right? Yeah. 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 And uh, we saw each other in May. I think it was about May 24th when mm -hmm. we saw each other and went for dinner together with my professor Ron yes yeah, it's lovely yeah yeah it's yeah. really cool to see that kind of collision of worlds Ron Dart he is a, my professor from U UFV University of the Fraser Valley he was my first introduction into political philosophy and then to see obviously you and Jordan meeting him when you were kind of my introduction into the wider world of political media right. and deeper philosophy that was like very very cool for you know the younger spirit in me when, uh -huh. when I was like 18, 19, just getting into it all. <laughs> yeah. And what brought you to start into activism at such a young age? And how did that happen? And why did you do it? Oh, man, I feel like I've spent these last few years reassessing my entire childhood and life. And I, I, I had a very strange childhood. I grew up in a super evangelical family. We listened to a lot of American podcasts and, and media and so like Dennis Prager I was mm -hmm. listening to when I was like eight years old on the way to school mm. um, Plenty plenty of podcasters Michael Medved all of them and You know, it was really my Graduating year grade 12 in high school that a lot of the woke kind of progressive changes started to take place in the education system. We had social justice courses just introduced that year where we were taught how evil whiteness was and mm -hmm. how oppressive men are and these kind of things. And it, it felt so overblown compared to the world I had experienced at that time, especially because when I was younger, I went to a, I briefly went to a private school that was uh, highly Chinese immig immigrant um, populated and they're very, very wealthy. So being mm. told, you know, white people are always the rich oppressors when you've lived in Vancouver your whole life, where actually the wealthiest people are not usually the white population, mm -hmm. was very strange. And having grown up in the Christian community where men are generally very kind, decent people being told that these individuals are evil, hate mm -hmm. me and, and mm -hmm. want me under their thumb. And <laughs> it, it just didn't quite add up with the reality that I was seeing around me. And I got quite fired up about that. But the world has become a bit more nuanced since, but still I retain a lot of that, those feelings. <laughs> and, and what do you think about, I'm curious, you know, all of the activism that there is now among the young people and your experience getting into that life early, but now it's another almost 10 years later. And what would you say to some of these young people 
who are thinking that they have the answer mm. to their questions? That is such a hard question to answer because you never want to jade young people, right? right, right. And, and there's no doubt that I've been jaded. And I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. But the way I see it is the political beast that mm -hmm. exists to stay in it for a long time and become kind of the old guard of the political beast. You have to deal with a lot of dark themes, a lot of lying, a lot of betrayal, a lot of narcissism, ego. You really have to keep your ego up to survive in the political media atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So. Not everyone, but a good portion of the people that survive within both the political and media sphere, uh, I, they are pretty, you're going to have a higher percentage of dark triad personalities, I reckon, in yes. those positions. Mm -hmm. And I do believe to an extent the population, they, they can sense whether someone is genuine or not. They can really feel to a degree whether people believe what they're saying. And because of that, I feel a lot of the older guard of the political and media class recruit young people who still have a genuine enthusiasm to be the vanguard of their ideas of, or their causes. Mm -hmm. So people can look at something that really is pure, that really is coming from a good place. And a lot of the young people don't realize that they're being used and abused to sell narratives that aren't entirely true, that are for much greater, darker motivations, financial or otherwise, power-wise. And I'd say for young people, be be careful treading those waters. Be ready to meet uh, people capable of things you would never comprehend. And be ready to meet wonderful, lovely people mm -hmm. that actually have a lot of darkness behind them. But not all. There's very good... Uh, even, even when I was in university, I remember my professor Ron telling me, mm -hmm. Lauren, you got to find the university within the university. The, the people that are there that really want to nurture you and really want to care and grow your mind. And that exists within the media sphere too, in the political sphere, the politics going on within the politics, the people trying to fight from within a broken system. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, definitely look out there. There are a lot of predators, a lot of sharks out there. I yeah. mean, that's a pretty common given. <laughs> well, the dark triad, you know, people yeah. don't, I don't know if they know what that is, but that's narcissism, right? That, and that, that's the whole, used to be a triad and now is the four parts of someone who's in really in it for themselves. Yeah. So maybe you could describe to people what you meant by that. Yeah, well, I mean, <sighs> there's very few things that are more fragile than reputation and everything in politics and media is about reputation, right? Yeah. So people that survive for a very, very long time in these atmospheres without having massive attacks against them, you know, massive media. I mean, look at someone like Jeffrey Epstein. The media didn't touch him for years, or even Harvey Weinstein. The media mm -hmm. didn't touch these people for years because they were very good at playing the blackmail game. They were very good at owning all the right companies to ensure that their reputation could be protected. You've even got companies that will scrub people's Google search pages, right? And mm -hmm, keep mm -hmm, them entirely, mm -hmm. oh, it's just their charity donations will be the first results mm -hmm. that come up. So you will have these personalities that will be very powerful within the media and political apparatus that will want to hire you, will want you to work for their campaigns, whatever it might be, um, that you will never discover what they're truly like until you're actually working in that office or until you're yeah. working in that media company with them because they've, the, yeah, they're, they're, they've curated, it's, it's, in this sphere, it's actually rewarded to act in psychopathic ways. They're very good at lying, very good at blackmailing, very good at ruining anyone who goes against them. That was something I definitely learned the hard way going into media. I uh, really felt like I was backstabbed more than a few times. I try not to have a victim complex about it because I'm perfect, not perfect by any means myself, but uh, I certainly don't do anything with malice to others. And I can stand by that. Mm. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, be be very careful. There's, I think, I, I'm sure, I mean, you've been in the media sphere yourself and met a lot of people. I, I'd say that generally there's just a higher level of narcissism and ego when people want to be on camera well, those in are general. Well, people who say yes. Yeah. When, you know, when you've given a public, public opportunity, that sounds like a good idea. Yes. If you're someone who likes to have the attention put on them. Well, this is what I find very interesting about the... Uh, gender dynamic podcasts coming out today. I'm not sure if you've seen them, like the whatever podcast mm -hmm. or Fresh and them. Fit. Mm -hmm. They 
bring on I've a lot of these of them, but, girls mm -hmm. who do OnlyFans right. or girls off Instagram or the street, and then they'll interview them and mm -hmm. uh, ask, like, what are you looking in, looking for in a man? What um, what are your dating preferences? And there'll be some of the most superficial answers you'll ever hear. Well, he has to be making $500,000. He has to be over six foot tall, right? And then these clips go viral of, look how awful women are. Look how horrible their standards are. And you can do this to men as well, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Just clip him, clip him, clip him. And people don't realize that this is never going to be a proper analysis of the general public because these are all the people who are saying, yes, put me on camera. Yeah. Anyone who says yes, you're already not getting the general population, because the general population are typically terrified of public speaking. Mm -hmm. It's one mm -hmm. of their worst fears, right? Right, right, right? So you're already getting people that are more veering into the narcissism stuff. And I think that's probably the biggest plague of our generation, my generation Looks too. Like it. And my yeah. biggest internal battle is fighting my ego as well, mm -hmm. going on camera. And the better I get at fighting my ego, the more nervous I am about going on camera, funny mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I really do believe it's, skewing our entire perception of the world, the type of people that want to be on camera versus those who don't, and us assuming the people on camera are any sort of representation of what the public actually want. <laughs> See, I would say I, would, I was the type of person who was, had mixed feelings about it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say I was against it, but I wasn't, but I wasn't craving it, you know? Mm. And the way that I've dealt with it um, most recently is before I prepare, I, I ask for courage and strength because I don't have it in myself hmm. to come here and, and do this. I know that I need all the help I can get. And um, admitting that really is helpful to me. It gives me what I need to not run away, right? Hmm. Otherwise, I wouldn't think I was enough. I, would, I, I wouldn't think that it, I had it in me or that I had the questions, the uh, aptitude or anything, so I'd run away, but if I ask for courage and strength, somehow, don't ask me how, that comes to me, and then I can be here. Well, I think it's the people like you that need to be in front of cameras more, but it, it's such a catch-22. <laughs> it is, it? it's a catch-22, <laughs> but I think also in this environment now where we're talking, and everybody's talking, and everyone's taking snippets of what people say, we all have a responsibility to say our to say what we think mm. and not leave it unsaid yeah this is another problem i find in my so after obviously i, I did a video recently talking about uh, my divorce and separation i watched it and um after having felt i made such a catastrophic decision for my life mm -hmm. and something that was so psychologically traumatic for me i lost a lot of trust in my own decision making and my own mm -hmm. confidence of what i was saying and it was very hard for me to get back on camera and do videos very difficult i'll go and i'll watch videos of, of my younger self who objectively knew less about the world and how much confidence i spoke with and I, it, when you speak with confidence, people believe you, even if you're incorrect. Right, right. It, that's just how it works, right? So I'll watch myself say something completely false now that I know with more life experience. <laughs> and yet I will be far more convincing than when I speak today because I have way more self-doubt. I think it's a healthy self-doubt, but you've mm -hmm. got to balance it. And I fear that it really is, I mean, I think it's pretty self-evident that there are a lot of people who have a lot of knowledge about the world that because they know so much about the world, also know they know so little. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and do not want to be a representative for anything, but desperately need to be. Yes. Because there's this vacuum where there's a whole lot of young people that haven't experienced life yet that have got a whole lot to say, a whole lot of confidence in not making mistakes. The, the people that I see give the most stringent, you know, so the strongest advice about marriage and dating are almost always those that are not in relationships themselves. They've never been married, you know, this kind of stuff, right, because right, they, they haven't right. had the chance to fail yet. Yeah. They haven't had the chance to really experience how difficult things can be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In a way, you know, even, even when you stay together in a marriage, people say it's a successful marriage, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that no. you fail pretty, pretty much off right off the starting block because mm. you realize that uh, what what did i think when i was going to get married i was going to marry a man who had no problems 
I was going to have children that had no problems. You know, I wasn't going to have any of the problems my parents had. I was, I was going to be, of course. you know, I had, <laughs> I had all of these ideas. And then, and then I got married and I learned I was very naive. Mm. I was very naive. Wow. There's nothing worse than learning how naive you are. It's such an uncomfortable yeah. thing. <laughs> but thank goodness, because if yes. we don't learn that, then what happens? Exactly. If you don't learn that, then you end up with these ideas that you continue to have and I find get you have in to, trouble. Yeah. In order to like maintain the naivety, you have to restructure the entire world around you and how you perceive it and how you think. Well, then you blame, you start blaming the world. Yeah. Right? Because if it's not fitting my narrative, then there's something wrong out there. But when you have a marriage and you uh, and kids, so you or you have a community, right? Because you can have a community. I think we need a community. As I got older, I think more and more I realize how how important community is, um, and that we live really. Some people live in solitary lives now, and and how destructive that'll be. Because you need people to kind of push you into shape and to shake you up when you're going the wrong way. And if you're naive, and you're thinking that the world is a certain way and it isn't that certain way, then you're gonna sometimes you're gonna try to blame before somebody hopefully close to you says, "No, actually, it's you." Mm -hmm. All right, you got to update who mm -hmm. you are. So. You said at the beginning of that video that Dr. Peterson, you'd had a talk with Dr. Peterson. Yes. <laughs> so uh, how how did that advice that he gave you, how did that influence what you decided to do? It's it's funny. Um, his advice was just tell the truth. Yeah. Like, just, just tell the truth. I had all these things spiraling around in my head that were keeping me up at night and truly destroying my mental health in, in ways that I can't even begin to describe. But um, it's amazing how much stress it puts on the body not telling the truth. I genuinely, like disease must be caused by that. I could feel yeah. myself sick, not sleeping, mm -hmm. all these things mm -hmm. by not speaking what I was actually witnessing with my eyes and living. And uh, what, what I had experienced in my life that was somewhat contradictory to some of the narratives that I had supported publicly. Um, but yeah, his advice was just, just tell the truth. It's going to start simplifying your life so much. and. Um, my professor Ron always had kind of a similar idea. He's like, you've got so many webs, so many webs built of things you haven't spoken about, things you aren't communicating to those around you and you have to start slowly unraveling those webs. It's gonna seem like a huge task to start with, um, but once you do it, it's, it's a relief every time. And it was, it was such a relief to publish my video about my marriage and how life didn't exactly go how I expected it to. Mm -hmm. um, because, and you know, I have family and friends around me that would say, why are you doing this? No one does this, Lauren. Like, you don't have to put all your dirty laundry out there. And I really didn't want it to be dirty laundry. Mm -hmm. I, I left out any unnecessary, mm -hmm. you know, malice, nothing like that. I didn't put in there. But um, just letting people know, like, I am a broken human being that has made mistakes and made incorrect decisions and been very confidently wrong before. That's not a good career decision in politics. It's not a good career decision in media, but it is a good spiritual decision. And um, I would rather have a recovering soul than a booming media career built off of a person who doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> and right, right. it has immensely, immensely helped my mental health. And it was a lot easier than I thought it would be telling the truth, because you'll be amazed when you tell what the truth. What kind of things changed? Um, your sleep, maybe. Yeah. My sleep changed. Yeah, definitely. I was able to sleep huh? much, Isn't much that something? better. Yeah, it's crazy. There's, I, I completely believe there is a link between, um, yeah, just your health in general and what is going on in your mind. Do you know mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Gabor Mate? Yeah. He, he's talked a bit about even like with things like cancer, how in mm. at some moments in people's lives, as horrible of a thing as it is, it's been the thing that woke them up and told them you need to start living differently yeah you need it's almost like a manifestation of living your life in the wrong way mm -hmm. living a lie yeah and then it was that that woke them up and said actually death is coming one day the end of my life and do i really want to say this is how i've lived my life and i, I definitely thought about that with with my son, my family, the people around me. If I died tomorrow, would I want them to see this version of myself or the real, honest version of myself? 
and it's a much better, much lighter living. It's dropping a load off your back for sure when, when you just kind of open up about <laughs> how crazy life can get. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I watched Farmland. Oh, you did? This morning at five in the morning. Wow. Woke up and watched Farmland. That was a good way to start the day. Yeah. That was, you did, that was a great movie. Thank you. Yeah, I thought you did a wonderful job. So even though that was a while ago mm -hmm. that you made that movie, what, what year was it done? Uh, I came out in either 2017 or 2018, yeah. I think 2017. Oh yeah, you, very brave, you know, and those people that you interviewed um, gave them a voice. Uh, I, 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 you know, I commend you. I think that that was really good work done. Thank you. So it, like, how how are you bringing the work that you did forward into the future? Hmm. Uh, I'm going to be starting doing some more documentary work mm -hmm. in, in the next few months here, but I'll be honest, it's, it's really, it's been difficult the last few years to get back into my work in documentary making, especially on topics that are more controversial or there's kind of less consensus around them, like something like farmlands, where I'm going in and I'm going against the entire media apparatus. Mm -hmm. I'm going again. I'm, you know, opening myself up to all sorts of accusations of racism, conspiracy theory, all of this. And I did have to deal with a lot of that, despite mm -hmm. it very much being proven true to this day. Um, so it's been hard to trudge into that territory with confidence again. But I think now that I'm catching my stride. Mm -hmm. Uh, psychologically healing from a pretty crazy past. I, I will say there, there's been more, more than just the marriage uh, falling apart, which is very psychologically traumatizing to me. Being so close to the government apparatus with what my um, ex did for work and kind of seeing how it worked behind the scenes mm -hmm. also struck a lot of fear in my heart of I am incredibly naive about how powerful governments actually are, how much they're monitoring us, how much they can affect and change the collective psyche through manipulating algorithms and uh, realizing what a behemoth I was against. I feel like when I was younger mm. and I was like, of course I can change the world. Of course I can beat these governments. Of course I can win with truth. I could do stronger work. And now that becoming jaded has been such a, uh, horrendous thing for my ability to create new content. So I, I, I need to kind of get that mindset of the 300 where, okay, even if we're not going to win, we're going to protect Sparta at all costs <laughs> and we'll die trying and just go forward because that's yeah. the right thing to do. So yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. getting more my stride and getting back into that mindset. And I think I'll have some exciting stuff in, in the near future. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. But you're at home right now with your son. Yes, I just, I needed the summer with my son. We've been spending a lot of time out on the water, swimming, yeah. out in nature, hiking. Um, oh my goodness, he is such a personality. He's the funniest little kid. He, uh, the trouble I'm having with my son right now is he is three years old, Yeah, but he looks like he's five because oh, he's so he's tall. tall. Huh? He's a big, mm -hmm. big kid. Mm -hmm. And people will speak to him mm. and expect things from him oh, yeah. as if he is five years mm -hmm. old or mm -hmm. six years old. And I can't tell if that's helping him or doing damage because I can't tell if it's raising the bar of expectations or if it's making him feel incompetent because he's mm -hmm. expected to do all these things that he may not be ready for yet. And that's the kind of battle I'm trying to Well, there's that idea right of proximal... Um, so when you have siblings, if they're siblings, the older siblings uh, challenge the younger siblings to do more than they can, right? So the, and they talk to them a little bit more sophisticated than they are. But I don't know if it's two years more, right? I don't know what the proximal, mm. proper proximal distance is between... Um, and parents do that to kids automatically. They talk to them with a little bit more sophistication than they have so that they're always being challenged to grow up and to uh, broaden what they know. But I don't know exactly how far that is. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But if he's feeling, I think you can probably tell by his reaction to it. If he can mm. deal with it, then it's probably just fine. 
if you mm -hmm. know if it's if it's uh, daunting to him and and frustrating and if he's shying away from it maybe it's too much but I think you can take the cues from him yeah par yeah parenting is such an amazing thing it's it is isn't it really incredible it's on the road like you're it's in the moment yeah yeah the parenting and it's constant 24 7 yeah I've had to uh, really study and adjust so much of my behavior um, one thing I noticed as a single mother now, mm -hmm. it's like weird even saying that out loud. Yeah, but um, yeah. there's, I, I think probably one of the biggest problems with single motherhood today is the shame around it. And I'm, it's not mm -hmm. to say that, mm -hmm. you know, obviously it's not ideal. This mm -hmm. is very obvious. And this is obvious to anyone who is in, in the position I'm in. Um, but because there's so much shame around it, I feel that there is a internal want to make up for the mistake like you, you almost uh, want to over coddle your child. You want mm. to be so loving and so doting because right, you've right. got this guilt mm -hmm. about wanting, you, you know, I want more for you. I want more for you. Mm -hmm. And I've had to kind of conquer that and be like, because I've, I've had to create a bit more of a masculine inside myself where I'm like, no, he's a boy. He needs structure. Mm -hmm. You can't just coddle and dote. That's yeah. going to create a monster in the future, Lauren. Yeah, like yeah. You have to be very self-aware about this internal guilt. You have to conquer that, get over it, move forward healthier. But I do see it uh, among you know other mother friends that I know that are single mothers. The And people always talk about, oh, it's higher crime rates, higher, yeah. you know, le uh, more difficulty within the education system. And I, I do think that there are compensatory measures that a lot of single mothers take that are not helpful that come from the guilt and shame of it. Whereas I think if you get over that and really start to take the steps and bring in the community for support, yeah. have male support, male support. Yeah, you do. You really you need both genders. He does have male support, oh, right? Incredible. Yeah. Incredible men in his life. The best of the best. I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, yeah, but you really, it really does make you realize both having kids and then experiencing what I've experienced being a single mother, just how important both men and women being in yeah. children's lives are and how important the feminine and the masculine is. And I think, you know, the narrative in our society has been uh, single parents are just as good as, mm -hmm. you know, a mother and a father. And so there's been, and, and, and there's been this argument, but if we could agree to understand that there's an ideal yeah. Like you said, there's an ideal and the deal, the ideal is mother, a biological mother and father and children in a family, but that there's always going to be uh, the fringes around the ideal and we have yeah. to have room for those fringes, then there doesn't have to be guilt because it's all necessary and the new ways of understanding the world come from the fringes. They're necessary. They're just not ideal. Yeah. Right. And so all of that is important. The whole structure is important. We don't need to demonize any of it, but we we can't take the idea. We can't take the fringe and say this is the ideal because then you're going to start to have. Yeah. No. You know? And I would never, never no, in a million years, would I suggest that my situation is the ideal. I've uh, spent two years being psychologically tormented by, yeah, yeah. <laughs> by you know, not living up to the things that I wanted to. Um, Another interesting thing I've, I've really realized is, you know, there's this fight going on. We need more femininity in the world, not in men, but in, in women. Yeah. People are very frustrated that women aren't as, as feminine as they were before. Um, I completely and utterly lost my feminine energy as soon as I became a single mother because I believe that feminine energy very much comes from a place of feeling protected, mm. feeling safe. It's mm. like... It, it's very fragile almost, but not in a bad way. Like there are a lot of things that I think can be fragile, but very powerful, like a microchip to a computer. You gotta, you can't step on that, right? right. <laughs> but it can do a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's the feminine energy too. It can rebuild men's souls. It can nurture children. It can mm -hmm. do all of these wonderful things. But you know, when you have to be the one that goes out with the shotgun, cause there's a bear there, you have to just get rid of that feminine energy. You can't think it's cute. You can't want to hug it. You can't, you gotta kill it. So it's like to be the, in the masculine position and trying to fulfill that role mm -hmm. really makes it difficult for the feminine to thrive where it has to be protected and really feel safe. Mm -hmm. And I think I see a lot of the struggle in modern dating and, and gender dynamics. Like if, if women don't feel safe and supported, which is almost impossible sometimes for men to do because you can't live on a single income anymore yeah and men's 
aggression, even healthy aggression, trying to protect their wife or their children, is punished by the state. You'll、mm-hmm. be arrested for saving a subway full of people being threatened by a man, right? Yeah.、Um, the lack of masculine being used in a healthy way causes for the just obliteration of the feminine. Women,、yeah. women go into the masculine role where they're like, "Hey, I gotta survive. Yeah, I gotta protect myself. I gotta make money. I can't be out here, you know, just a weakling."、Mm-hmm. Especially with more manipulation going on and、uh, the whole dating scene being such a mess. Like, we're not going to see a revival of the feminine until. We see a revival of the masculine and the protector, and the government aren't, aren't even allowing for that. So it's a very scary position to be in right now. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, because the whole idea of、uh, boys in education—they're not nurtured. Their their masculinity isn't nurtured at all,、mm-hmm. and so we're not even starting out with little kids and making their masculine traits. Uh, the giving them the generosity、uh, that they, the generosity and and、uh, the guidance, the guidance, generosity, the shaping and the encouragement that they need. Like because、mm-hmm. children, both sexes, they both, they both need that, and they have different qualities. And you want to, I mean, I have all these little kids with me. I have eleven kids under three at this family reunion.、Mm-hmm. That's、oh、a lot of、goodness. little kids. That's a dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious. It's hilarious. But there's uh, my uh, my uh, and and little boys and little girls are different. You know, my son's three year old boy. He's quite sensitive,、hmm. and he's quite sensitive.、Uh, he's thought very thoughtful and sensitive. He likes to ride his bikes and he likes、yeah. to play with trucks and everything. It's it's not that he's not nurturing whatever masculinity he has, but he's a very thoughtful. And then there's my. Nephew's little boy, and he is like a—he's like a cement truck, <laughs> right? <laughs> and all he wants to do is run into things and run over things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just and it's so funny to watch. They're so different, these kids. But every bit of them, we have to—we have to embrace and、mm. and just say, yeah, you are. Who you are, and I wonder who that's going to be,、mm-hmm. N- and not get in the way of it. Absolutely, right? Not get in the way of it. You don't want to get in the way of who your son is, right? You just want to nurture him. Absolutely. Yeah.、Well. Teach him how to fish. <laughs> that's the plan. That's、yeah. coming up. Are there any salmon <laughs> where you are? There are. It's、uh, a lot of the kind of. Massive schools of fish that come by tend to be anchovies, but it, oh, if, it, you're, yeah, yeah, if yeah. you're in the water, oh, that's can, what that's what's black. Oh, I'll show、water? you a picture though. It looks like a giant sea monster is、oh, coming、wow. through because、yeah. there's so many and they're so close together,、oh, and the seals、good. will be hunting them. So yeah, I get, I don't want to be out in the water. I'm a bit nervous about the seals, but you can walk out and take a net and just grab them. How big are the、oh, seals? Oh, there's a, are there some of them big? There's some huge ones. I saw a white、oh. one two days ago that I thought was like a beluga whale. I don't think we have those out there, but that's how big it was. Wow! And, wow. Yeah,、um, they're they're. You think of them as little, but they're not no, little. No, they're huge. The sea is an incredible place. We've got a.、Uh, Porpoises as well. I always、oh, yeah. think they're dolphins, but I guess、mm. they're slightly different. Yeah! Wow! What a great summer, eh?、Hey? Yeah. I、Magical、mean, cougars、summer. and bobcats are usually out hunting at night. Yeah. So you'll literally you hear them. Hear them. Oh it's, wow! Like nature is just. Alive and and the order of nature. There's constantly just life and death like around you, twenty four seven. I got Bambi going across the street in the morning, <laughs> and then at night it's like a bobcat is ripping something to shreds, and you're listening to that just like horrific death. But there's something very raw about it、mm-hmm. that even though it's horrific, I like it a lot better than you know scrolling doom scrolling my phone at night, like sitting、yes. on the deck and、yeah. looking at the stars and hearing something being killed by、yeah. a bobcat is somewhat more comforting. Do you see any northern lights where you are? Or、are no, you too far south? No, I don't. There's been a few moments where they've said like the northern lights were supposed to be visible where I was, but、uh, mm. no, no. That's what I'm hoping because we're going up to Saskatchewan next, and I'm hoping that because often we'll see great northern lights there,、oh. and those things put you in your place. Wow. So I want to ask you a question about alt right being identified as alt right.、Mm-hmm. Um, That was you were identified as that early on, like、yeah. right at the beginning, probably、yeah. of what you were doing. How accurate was it then, and how accurate is it now? 
it's how do we even define the word alt right? It's very challenging. I just based on what the popular definition is, I wouldn't call myself alt right, and I don't think the members of the alt right would refer to me as that. I mean, am I alternative to the mainstream? Yes. Am I dissident? Sure. Uh, but uh, what, whatever, if they define that as white nationalist, if they define that as uh, racist, whatever you want. I mean, are you going to even find many people that call themselves white nationalists that would refer to themselves explicitly as racist? I don't even think so. It's even answering the question this way is going to get me in trouble. You're just supposed to say no and give no explanation and just say you hate them and they're all bad, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not that, but it's it was a very convenient thing for the media at the time. Mm -hmm. They always need an enemy. There is a massive shortage of racists and a massive uh, <laughs> demand for racism. Right, right. So finding a blonde girl who uh, gets headlines going and clicks that yeah. they can uh, ascribe any horrible view possible to, it, it works well. And this is, <laughs> I mean, I, I toured uh, Australia with Stefan Molyneux, for mm -hmm, example, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, Stefan is, he was far more educated on a lot of <laughs> any of these topics than I was, but they would always put me as the front cover page oh, on the tours right? and they'd never put Stefan or every once in a while, but it's because they needed the blonde girl to get the clicks to hype people up about this racism problem happening around everywhere. It's even that blonde girl at your Starbucks. She's, she's a neo-Nazi coming to get you. Yeah. Uh, so I think it was very convenient for the media mm -hmm. at the time and being me and being very adverse to power and, and the mainstream and normalcy, I almost enjoyed leaning into it. I won't lie. You get to a point where people lie about you so much mm -hmm. or invent such preposterous levels of evil about you that you almost are like, fine. I'll be, you want right. me to be that? I'll be that for you. I'll put on the black boots and march and I'll be your villain if mm -hmm. that's all you're going to let me be. And uh, I, I, that wasn't the right approach, but at the time it felt like a big, you know, F you to the people that just wanted to portray me as whatever they needed for their headline that day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the headlines are a little better to this day, but it doesn't matter because once you are labeled as that, it follows you forever. Since we don't live in a world in which humans evolve and grow, we, we really like to keep things stationary in boxes. The human experience is not one that evolves. They really want to keep people in their little, little cults. And uh, so to this day, like I'm still banned from the United Kingdom. Jordan's having that wonderful ARC conference that I was invited oh, to. I can't, can't go. go. It's in London. Oh, yeah. Um, banned from Australia. Uh, I'm on their terrorists, their list of terrorists and criminals and, and whatnot. I still have investigations into me. I, I had the Canadian government investigating me. I haven't talked much about that. I can tell you a bit more about it later. I was banned from the U.S. for a few years. And this is all, that was when I was not involved in politics when I had left to have a baby and to this day, right? Mm. So mm. it's, it's quite it a label. Because it was following you, because yeah. it was following you, yeah. It's quite a label. Uh, it'll, it'll really uh, affect you for the rest of your life. And you know, when you're 18 years old, just saying what you think. I, I never thought you, you, people would be punished to the degree that they are today for saying what they think. Mm -hmm. And certainly what I would have thought an older generation of writers for the Atlantic and the New York Times and whatnot, what their role would be, would be to say, hey, you may have gotten this wrong. Let's, let's guide you as a young person entering the world of politics. Let's mm -hmm. have some, you know, humility knowing that we too were 18 once upon a time and maybe uh, had questions about the world. Yeah. And maybe we should actually give answers instead of just throwing labels at these people. But no, no, it's been a disgusting thing to see people in, in with age rather than garner wisdom and share it with younger people, destroy the reputations of the youth for mm -hmm. their own gain. Mm -hmm. That is like the cannibalizing of some of the older generations that I think is destroying the world. You know, we no longer have uh, an older generation that are planting the oak tree they're never going to see for, for the next you have them cannibalizing the prospects of young people, both in the housing market, in the public policy being put together today, and in media. And uh, if, what if do you people, mean, what do you mean by can cannibalizing? Uh, well, you look at like the immigration policies in, mm -hmm. in Canada. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's propping up the housing market quite a bit because yeah. the, I mean, 
both my sister and I were just, uh, the homes we were previously living in were put up for sale because um, the people can't afford their mortgage rates anymore, right? It's getting absurd. Mm -hmm. The inflation, everyone's losing jobs, no one can afford the rent. But uh, the only way to keep the housing market really artificially propped up is to have hordes of immigration coming in so that there's so much demand. People, you have families of 20 people buying one house all together, pooling their resources and, you know, a family of two parents, two kids can't afford can't anything, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But keeping those immigration numbers up will keep that housing and property prices up, which of course, most of the politicians, most of the board members, all of these people making these decisions are property owners in Canada. They don't want these prices to collapse. Um, I think there are a lot of decisions being made like that that are cannibalizing the future of the youth. I see. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I don't think that's the only reason immigration is happening. Of course, it, there's uh, trying to... Well, they're trying to prop up the population without having Canadians have families, large families. Yeah, and it's gotten to a point where, like, I looked at the Canada celebration they had uh, in Toronto Square, and uh, they had Punjabi music playing and everyone Mm -hmm. was out dancing. There were no white people. And I'm not even mad anymore. I can't be mad at the people there because, what? first of all, they were given this opportunity. They're Mm going to take it. Mm -hmm. Um, What culture are they going to assimilate to? There's right. there's no Canadian culture left. There be this is being encouraged by the governments. Yeah, you know, no Canadian culture. Canadian culture is racist, evil. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. we we are a post nation <laughs> state. We we no longer believe in the nation. So the people who are coming in, if anyone's blaming them at this point, it's like you can't. They're just taking what's being given to them, and they're celebrating the only culture they know. Because right. <laughs> we don't have one here the anymore. The culture that they brought. Uh, yeah. uh, we got to take a look at the generations that sold us out and the politicians that sold us out. <laughs> yes. And of course, you can't blame the entire boomer generation. You can't blame the entire millennial generation for having bad takes. But we do have to look at themes that you know persist throughout these generational behaviors and how they've affected the way that our country is going. Well, what do you think feminism has to do with that? (sighs) Because it's not just the government and it's not just big business. And it's also the feminist ideology that has been taught since for a very long time. I think there's a very skewed version of liberal feminism, girl boss feminism, I like to call it. There's intellectual versions of feminism that I have a lot of appreciation for that kind of just recognize the natural order. And well, there's feminist, there's freedom feminism, and then there's care feminism. So, but the care feminism, yeah. that's not even, that's not nurtured like the freedom feminism. No, that's a big deal. Or yeah. at least that's what Mary Harrington calls it. And I think that's kind of a good... Uh, explanation of two the two different ways of thinking about it so i'm talking about the freedom feminism yeah well any it's it's so tough because as a as a woman it's like you don't you don't want to betray your sex right Right, right. (laughs) you never want to betray your sex and you understand intimately the struggles that they go through and Mm -hmm. um but there, there absolutely is an aspect of, and this can go for any race, any group of, I am inherently a victim and I inherently deserve what I am being given and what I'm getting. And I am, I've definitely seen this with a lot of my male friends who have worked their butts off to get into industries, to be fighter pilots, to uh, work their way up the office and to see women being given those positions simply because they are women. Mm-hmm. I. I in a way, I almost think it's anti-feminist because, or whatever, fe- if the most positive version that feminists would like to be portrayed as, it's anti-that. Because uh, I've never seen something create so much sexism and dis- disdain for the other sex in my entire life. It, it creates a belief that, first of all, this system has nothing to offer me if I work hard. So it, it offers things based on superficial aspects, race, uh, gender, sexuality, these mm-hmm. kind of things. So. Mm-hmm. I, I get kind of peeved when I see people getting mad at Gen Z or millennials for being the laziest generation. You never want to show up to work. Well, they've repeatedly been kind of just kicked while they're down. Not mm-hmm. we're going to give this woman the promotion over you because, well, we got to meet a quota. We're going to give this, you know, wh- wh- whoever it is, a promotion yeah. over you because there's quotas to me. And people give up on believing in any sort of meritocracy in the system, certainly with the way taxes work in Canada as well. It's like... Oh, I get ahead. I've made my first million dollars. The government's taking 500000 of it, and I yeah, can barely wow. get it's a funny. down payment on a house in the city I live in, despite being a millionaire. <laughs> it's, 
there's uh, there's been a lot of aspects, and feminism has certainly been one of them, and the entitlement complex of an entire gender believing that um, they're deserving of the world simply because of the the body they were born in, and this once again can apply. This can apply to race, sexuality, all of it. It's it's a a cancer of the mind that has affected women's ability to actually become their best selves as well. I would love to compete. I, maybe I wouldn't be able to. This is the truth. Maybe I wouldn't be able to compete in the media if we didn't have feminism today. Maybe that's that's the truth. Even if we had meritocracy, maybe you know they, they mm-hmm. just wouldn't feel they needed an extra woman on the panel, and I didn't have something to add. But at least I'd know. <laughs> At least I know whether what I was saying was truly meaningful and yeah. and deserved to be out there. Yeah, and I think people feel that way too about the affirmative action for mm. races too, because they don't people don't know now why they were not given the job or why they were given the job, yeah. because it's not about merit anymore. Yeah, and that's so confusing. It's so confusing because then you know what what do you do? I mean, I'm I'm pretty much at my retirement age, so. If I was 20 now and having to think that I was going to go out and get a job, you know, the only thing I have to talk about, I guess, is I moved from Alberta to Montreal when I was 19 and I needed a job and I couldn't get a job. Even if it said help wanted and I went in, they would say that the position was filled because I was English. They didn't want me to work in their shoe store or whatever it was. Mm. So I'd go by for weeks and I'd still see the wanted sign. So I knew I knew that they didn't want me because of uh, the language that I spoke. Mm. And so I ended up moving to Ottawa because I could work in English there and I could get enough work to pay f- my rent and then I could visit Montreal. But that was what it was like in about 1980. So that's that's the only time really that it was obvious to me was oh I see what this is like if I see this is what it's like to be someone who is denied entrance into whatever I'm trying to get into. This is what I think a lot of people that are constantly on the you know Twitter posting 400 things a day like trying to uh, shift the culture war it helps people who have already had a moment where they've woken up and realized the kind of politics they want to take an interest in. But for the most part, when I see people around me, their politics is formed by individual real life experiences. So how we behave in real life is so much more important than anything I could say online, anything yeah. anyone could say yeah. online. And uh, I think that's why we actually need to, uh, it, it, uh, people will be like, oh, who cares about how this politician acted in private or how this commentator acted in private, how they treat their family, this, that, and the other. Actually, that's, that's the, the most, most important, important thing. <laughs> it's what they do every day. Yeah, it's what we do every day. And yeah. it's these individual experiences of, exper- of racism, of seeing a sign that says, uh, we're renting to Asians only when you're in Vancouver or Sydney, right? That's yeah, like, right. whoa. And, and people wonder why people are moving to the alt-right or you know more mm-hmm. extreme politics mm-hmm. in that regard. But then uh, this has brought me a lot of awareness after, you know, struggling a a little bit financially when I came back. Uh, Obviously, I had quit my job and was relying on my husband um, when I lived in Australia and when I came back to Canada and our marriage ended and I had to go back into work starting from zero. Um, Being around a lot of people that were more working class, Mm -hmm. living in a community that I, I was in a cabin, but there was a trailer park around me and these are the people that I was hanging out with experiencing rent issues you know Mm -hmm. never like watching your rent double overnight because landlord just decided to and then looking into the legal process of how can i fight this oh it's going to take me years to do and a bunch more money that i can't afford and this and that going through all of these financial issues has realized that has made me realize that this is why i think conservatives and the right are actually missing so many people and why they're there's a disconnect Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of those people, all they care about is how they're going to pay their rent. All they care about is how they're going to buy food for the week. Yes. It, and they see so much of the commentary today around the pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Just work harder and you'll get there. Yeah. But that is not how the world works. Yeah, they are not being hired because they are the wrong skin color. They are not being promoted because they're a man or, you know, they inflation is through the roof. Cheese is $20 here in Canada today. And that is not this individual person's fault for not working too hard that it's $20. Mm -hmm. The rent for a one bedroom here, even outside the city, is coming on three grand. That's let alone a family home, right? None of this is the individual's fault. 
Uh, you know, there are aspects of your individual life that you can and should change to the absolute maximum degree that you can, and then you can complain. <laughs> but, um, th but there are still so many of these massive aspects that are completely out of the individual's control. So if I, I think if conservative politics and right-wing politics maintains this, well, poor people just aren't working hard enough mm -hmm. idea, yeah. it's going to, they're going to lose. They're going to lose the reality, uh, you know, contest. Yes. <laughs> they're not talking about reality anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. No, uh, a conservative attitude has to take into consideration also what the left takes into consideration and that's what story are you going to live by mm -hmm. who are you going to be what what do you want to be known for i mean you thought of that you're very young and you thought of that what am i going to be known for mm -hmm. and that made you think about who you were and how you're going to run your life you know it's not about uh, it's not it's not about those uh, superficial conservative or liberal attitudes it's really about the the ones that are going to keep you alive through thick and thin mm -hmm. when you have tragedy mm -hmm. come that's to your exactly door it. then what is it that's going to get you up the next day what got what, what got you up the next day when you were feeling like your bottom had fallen out <sighs> Well, my son, you Your can't son? give up. Yeah, you can't have a mental breakdown. It's not a choice. Um, but in a weird way, I remember my first day of poli sci with Rondar. He said something very interesting. Uh, we were talking about drug addiction or something like that, and um, you know, obviously Hastings Street, the mm -hmm. East Side. It's it's brutal there right now. It's just a tent city that keeps extending mm -hmm. further and mm -hmm. further. Mm -hmm. And uh, you drive through there, and it's like a zombie apocalypse. People are tweaking out, there's an ambulance every second. And I remember Ron saying, uh, there are much darker and longer ways to lose your soul. And um, you can have everything completely together. You can have everything looking perfect and still somehow be in a worse place, worse place psychologically and spiritually than someone that's on the street, I've found. Mm. And I think if I had continued in, in my marriage, I don't think, I think I would be a husk of a human being without a soul because I, w I, I didn't talk about it in my video very much, but you know, there was a lot of psychological torment if, if I'm being honest. And um, you know, if I'd gone through that for 10, 15 years longer because of an image I thought I needed to retain, um, it was a small blessing of course that uh, my, my ex decided to end the relationship because I think I would have probably tried to, I, I, I'm not proud of saying it, but I think I probably would have tried to just, this is what I have to do because this is what I said I was going to do. Yeah. No matter what the circumstances are, I think I would have stayed. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think I would be a, I don't know where my soul would be. It would be a crumb inside me, gone. And so if, while there was so much pain that I went through the last two years, I'm almost happy I went through that like purifying fire, just rip the band-aid off and you just have to rebuild yourself from scratch rather than going down this long route of slowly disappearing. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people go down that route today just, to, just so they can say, no, I was not wrong. And this yeah. is on both sides politically, right? You can be the only fans girl that's saying, no, nope, I wasn't wrong and I'm not gonna let people say that I ruined my life and this is making me unhappy. I will not let them say that and I will continue down this no matter how miserable it makes me and no matter how much I have to sti stifle and mm -hmm. kill my soul to do it. And that can, I mean, lots of people, it's, it's, it's on the outside, it's on the outskirts, but it can happen on the conservative side too. I will go down this path because it's what looks right and I don't want people to tell me I was wrong and I made a bad decision here, even if it kills my soul. And that's yeah. ego. That's ego. That's ego. Yes. And uh, I, a lot of ego that needed to die. <laughs> and it, it hurt. It <laughs> is painful. <laughs> no one wants to admit they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a day, isn't it? That's a day. That's a day to take you from thinking you know everything in its place and then finding out that everything moves, mm -hmm. right? That everything, everything is moving and all we're trying to do is, is kind of keep up. Because mm. every day I start over again, right? I wake up yeah. in the morning, 
wake up in the morning and think, okay, what's here for me today and how can I approach mm -hmm. this in a way that's the best I can do. Yeah. I don't know that it'll be successful, but the best I can do. And that's like building, uh, have you ever read The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis? Uh, no, not yet. Oh, there's an incredible scene in it where um, you've got Greytown, which is hell, but people don't know they're mm. in hell. They just squabble all the time and they can have anything they want at any point, mm -hmm. build a house, whatever, but everyone just keeps moving further and further and further apart because they just, all they do is fight. And they can leave whenever they want and go to take this bus to heaven. They, mm -hmm. once again, they don't know it's heaven, but when they get there, it's very painful. They stand on the grass and it pokes them because they're very thin. They, they, there's not a lot of substance to their souls yet and they right. have to get stronger to exist in this environment without pain but to do that they have to do the inner work they have to figure out they have to kill the ego they have to forgive they have to do and they'll meet members of their family other past and there's one scene where there's a woman who was uh, she's like a she was a nobody in her life but she was so kind to people around her that when she gets to heaven she's just like this incredible lady who's singing and her husband who is quite um cruel to her comes up and when he comes up uh, to visit her, he's angry. How could you be here mm -hmm. and not living down in Greytown with me, right? Mm -hmm. But how they, how C.S. Lewis portrays him is he's a short little stubby man that's holding a leash to a very tall tragedian Muppet figure. And he speaks through the tragedian Muppet to his wife in this very powerful tone. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she always, she'll always look at the man and be like, just speak to me as you, right? Like, this isn't you, this is all silliness. But he's spent so long building up the tragedian Muppet, the, the person he wants to be, but who he isn't really, Yeah. Uh, that the little man becomes so small, he disappears into the ground, mm. and ceases to exist. And uh, I see in, in life, you can really be building up the, the tragedian Muppet, or you can be building up yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's like, maybe, <laughs> I, I'm no expert, but I think C.S. Lewis portrayal of that was very, very cool. Yes, yeah, and, that's uh, a good story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, well, you know, we, uh, well, we're, we're put here for a reason. And when we're young, it's all exploration. Mm -hmm. And then we get to a point where we think we know what's going on. And then we find out that we don't know what's going on. We and then that's when things begin. Mm. Mm. <laughs> right. <laughs> I had a friend of mine who was quite a political extremist that said uh, politics is like entering a dark room, and especially when you're young, you really have to feel the walls to orient yourself. You're blind, and and mm. this is also why I have so much frustration with when you have these you know 50 year old Atlantic writers like just ruining someone's college application at 17 because of something offensive they said like yeah. that's a kid that's feeling out the walls they shouldn't even be doing any of this in the public eye i never should have been in the public eye when i was 18 years old right that was my time to learn about the world and have stupid ideas have extreme ideas have them questioned and challenged by my elders and and go back and forth and i had to learn trial by fire going and seeing things firsthand what things i was right about what things i wasn't but um no, we need to have a lot, a lot more patience for people in that dark room, feeling out the walls. The, I, I think one of the greater problems, maybe why the impatience has occurred, is there used to be more systems of keeping out <laughs> people who were still feeling around the walls from the discourse, whereas now you've got every 13-year-old on Twitter, you know, mass spamming yes. political commentators or thinkers, you know, writers, and uh, they're probably the majority, if anything, is, is young people who haven't quite figured things out. And the funniest thing is when they're able to bully, like, full-grown adults into yeah. having ridiculous oh, opinions. Yeah. social media is a very <laughs> strange place, isn't it? It's so strange. I wish, I wish there was an identifier of someone's age, you know, someone's position when yeah. they commented. Of course, right. I don't agree with doxing, and I think people need to be allowed to be anonymous for various reasons, but I, I do think it would be a lot healthier if we understood where these opinions were coming from. And a lot of them are coming from bots, I believe. Uh, mm. A good portion of yeah, them, maybe even so half. strange. <laughs> well, it makes you wonder if we're even in a democracy anymore, because how can we say, you know, we're... When, when people are so influenced by social pressure and peer pressure, and they're so isolated now as to not see reality, many people working from home, locked in their right. houses for years under COVID, mm -hmm. and then you've got both governments, which I absolutely 100% believe is happening, mm -hmm. and corporations who are always in bed with governments, paying for insane 
amount of bots that people wouldn't even believe the level that this is happening to gaslight people into having certain opinions when they're changing the algorithms to, oh, no anti, you know, Mm -hmm. lockdown content on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No one's making an informed vote anymore. They're making the borderline like small tier MK Ultra is happening to the population on a mass scale through just getting flashed these images and these ideas that are not a natural you know, manifestation of the population's beliefs 24-7. Yeah. How can we say we live in a democracy where people are voting informed and intelligently and with with the true real information? And I, that's a good <laughs> question. How, we, how do we become informed, really? And I think we've lost our, com- our real communities, right? Yeah. Our in-person communities that keep us real. Yes. Yeah. And uh, we've got a replacement for everything. I mean, I'm I'm sure uh, Jordan has had to deal most of all with kind of the parasocial stuff. He's like everyone's parasocial dad now. Everyone Mm -hmm. who didn't have a father. It's, oh my goodness. And I think that's good to a degree. You know, people need that. Mm -hmm. But um, it gets to a level where it's like every aspect of people's lives becomes parasocial. My my town square is a Discord chat. My best friend is someone on Twitter or a video game I've never met in real life. And I was, you know, my my childhood was the beginning of this generation. Mm -hmm, I'd mm -hmm. wake up before school and I'd be playing video games like League of Legends and talking to all my online friends, many Mm -hmm. of which I'd never met in real life. And Mm -hmm. they were like proper relation. My first dating experience was in a video game. No way. Absolutely. I cried. I cried. I was like 14 years old and we broke up. And for all I know, that was like a 40 year old man, <laughs> a woman, you don't know, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that, that generation of, yeah, all of, there's always a, a weird filter of, of the internet and almost mm-hmm. lies and falsehoods and, and false portrayals. I think this has a lot to do with the trans phenomenon coming up with this generation as well. It, I, I have a lot of sympathy for transgender individuals. It's It's very... Uh, oh, especially yeah, people it's, it's heartbreaking heartbreaking and i understand where it comes from with how confusing gender roles are today men can't be masculine women don't want to be feel objectified there's lots of different reasons people are just like i gotta escape this mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. And, and the world makes you feel very trapped and people have different ways of dealing with it but uh in some ways the only way that the trans phenomenon can really thrive is by it being online because when you know people intimately in real life who have struggled with it which which i've known a few and i've they've been very dear friends of mine you know it's like just one of the most horrific experiences gender dysphoria that Mm -hmm. you can ever go through Mm -hmm. the the surgeries that the regret that comes with them Mm -hmm. when people i've known multiple people that have detransitioned and it's just like horrific and then even when you do transition for most people it's when you're out in general public people can tell not everyone but people can tell and so you always have this feeling of the imposter kind imposter of feeling. Imposter syndrome, yeah, absolutely. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, the only place that that is in a reality, watching someone go through the greatest mental health struggles of their lives, you know, trying to commit suicide, everything is online where you can Photoshop all these pictures, yeah, say right. everything's going perfectly fine. But everyone in the life of people posting this knows what the real life is like. But uh, I can thrive on the internet where there's no real corroboration of how reality is, is uh, affecting these individuals. I think that, you know, when we first started taking the birth control pill in the 60s, we never talked about oh, what the goodness, consequences yeah. of that uh, of that was for women. And because we never talked about it openly and discussed what the side effects were and did the research that needed to be done and made everybody aware, we've gone down this idea that men and young young people can take hormones and that it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. It's not okay. Like, it's just not okay. Not even the birth control pill. I mean, for, for, I did a, I did a podcast with a woman, with, with a woman who wrote a book called Your Brain on the Birth Control Pill. Mm -hmm. I've been waiting for a book like this so that I could discuss these issues. And the comments that I get, I get so many comments. And I know you get comments from people who've suffered, right? Those are the people who you get comments from. But, I know I suffered. Yeah. I suffered, and um, I don't think that we have talked about it properly. And now we're down a rabbit hole that that is just, like I said, heart. It's so heartbreaking. The birth control pill was enough trouble because it women started choosing mates 
that have narrow jaws, men who have narrow jaws mm. and are more feminine because they don't ovulate. When you ovulate, that's when you cho choose a masculine man. If you're not ovulating, then you don't don't choose masculine that's men. So and then bizarre. you go off the pill and you don't like your husband anymore because now you want somebody who's masculine. Crazy. You know, and so that was confusing enough and nobody knew that that, that was the case. And now we have all of these boys and girls trying to change themselves through hormones. And yeah. One, once you mess. understand how it works and how it affects people, you almost think it's a given because it's like, well, obviously hormones are going to mess with yeah, you. Yeah, right. But it's really not. I remember um, the first time I ever took birth control, I went to the doctor because I had really bad acne when I was in high school, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what do I do about this? Is there a cream, anything? Mm -hmm. And there are wonderful creams like tretinoin and mm -hmm. whatnot that you can try, but I didn't find that out until my own research much later in life. Yeah, yeah. Um, and instantly, oh, birth control. You don't even have to pay for yeah. it. Don't tell your parents. We'll give you a right. free one at the front desk. And I was like, oh, okay. I guess all my friends at school are also getting given their free birth control prescriptions for acne as well. And we'll yeah. all just take it. And like, I'm talking girls would literally take this just to get bigger boobs, right? Because it mm. is obviously affecting your weight. Yeah. Everyone gets more weight when they, not everyone, but almost everyone I know gains weight when they're taking this. Mm -hmm. The the idea that it's only doing the things you want it to do to your body and it's only making those changes is absurd. But when you're a kid and you just want what you want, uh, if adults allow you to have that, <laughs> yeah. you think they know what they're doing. I assume the doctor knows what's good for me. Yeah, and I didn't tell my mother I was taking the birth control pill. She she didn't know what was wrong with me because it made mm. me depressed. So, But she didn't know. and I, And because I was the one... Who was depressed i didn't know because you can't tell that you're yeah. you know when you're young like that and you're and you you change from being a kind of a happy outgoing kid and then you start to become more sullen you don't know why it is if you're not told that that's what it that's yeah. what's going to happen but that was and they used to give us pretty strong pills at the very beginning they were very very strong but you didn't have to tell your parents back then either Wow. This isn't a like this isn't a modern problem. This is the way it began. Was you didn't have to tell your mom that you were. You didn't have to go with your mother to the doctor to get your birth control pill. No, they just gave it to you. That's Back in the sixties, seventies. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of what is happening in the world and the little changes. You'll hear people talk about it all the time. Like something's off. Something's wrong. Like mm -hmm. the food, all of it. There's something weird. Uh, I think if we were all healthier and our guts were working properly, our minds would be working more clearly. Like yeah. when I'm out in nature and I've been I've been mm. on almost a fully like steak diet and I'm oh, having steak you? every night. My oh, son's eating steak, especially after I watched Michaela's episode about the mewing. Yes. I'm like, I want my son to have a good strong jaw yes, bone. Yes, so yes. you're gonna eat your steak. Good, and good, good. Yeah, I'm working on it. And uh, just the, the clarity it gives me out yeah. swimming every day, everything. It, it, I noticed things more. I remember I was picking up a tin and I, just like a simple thing, right? And I'm like, this tin is thinner. It's like half mm, as thin mm -hmm. as it was when I was picking these up five years ago. Yeah. You know, they don't put on the box like that they're making things cheaper, this or that. And people don't notice. They don't notice the shrinkflation that's happening, the corn syrup that's being added, the yeah. this and that. But when you're more in tune with your body, you're way more aware mm -hmm. of these little changes that happen and it affects you. You feel it. When I eat something that's from a fast food joint now, now that I've been eating cleaner, I feel sick for days. Oh, really? Now, huh? what is happening to people when they eat this every day yeah. and don't feel sick anymore? Yeah. I think people are assuming the state of sickness is just normal. And mm -hmm. this is another thing I look at with when people are, oh, the younger generation are so lazy. Maybe they're not lazy. Maybe they're just sick. Yeah, right. Maybe they can't Possibly. get out of bed in the morning. Maybe they don't have the motivation because they're eating poison all day. That was <laughs> not in the food of the silent generation or the boomers. Yeah, right. It wasn't even legal to be put in the food then, or rather people were just actually cooking at home and, you know, had mm -hmm. gardens and everything. Yeah, right. Uh, this has obviously been, I think, uh, Kennedy's uh, platform in the States. He did a documentary with Tucker Carlson. I can't remember what it was called. It was on... Uh, the, the decline of men or something, but he talked about all the different poison that is essentially in our food and being sold at grocery stores. And now half the stuff there is destroying men's testosterone, destroying women's hormonal systems, making people infertile. This should be the biggest issue. It shouldn't be debates over the Barbie movie. I'm sorry, I don't, mm -hmm. I really just don't care. <laughs> um, it should be the fact that our food is poison. We can't even 
get people to think clearly about your opinions on the Barbie movie until their brains are working properly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, like my my uh, story about the birth control pill. Yeah, I couldn't tell that yeah. I was suffering. It took well, it took me going off of the pill to realize that I was suffering. And a lot of the people who comment on this video say that they, you know, they go off. The woman who wrote the book, actually, she took the birth control pill, like some people do, from 15 to 30, and then decided to, and then had a baby and went off the birth control mm -hmm. pill and then went back on afterwards mm -hmm. and then went back and then went off it to have another baby. And, and she started thinking, huh, it's, my behaviors changed. You know, I got more, I, I was taking care of, better care of myself. I was getting interested in creative projects that I haven't done in years and stuff. She said to herself, I wonder if it's the birth control pill. So then she started looking into it and sure enough, it's crazy how changing one little thing yeah, will one little thing. completely change your life. It was saying, gluten yeah. and sugar are the big ones for, for me. I cut out gluten, that like completely just changed my gut, like <laughs> unreal. And then sugar completely changed my skin. Huh. I stopped eating sugar and I, I was getting like cystic acne yeah. all along my jawline. And then yeah. I cut out sugar and it was gone. Oh, and wow. it's crazy to me that once again, people are spending mm -hmm. like you know, $200 a month on this Accutane pill right. or proactive skincare. And you got to wonder, why are these actually effective solutions that will not only give you more energy and clarity of mind and longevity of life? Why are these not the things being educated in schools by governments? By, uh, it's just well, th very Well, the thing strange. I think of is I think someone's got a chronic illness and we don't know what to do about it because they're sick. We don't know why. Simplify their diet. Simplify their diet right yeah. right back down to meat. See if their symptoms normalize. Just see. Take it have them just eat meat for three months. See if things and then and then let them add food back in and see, but you only have one variable then. You only have one variable that you're mm. working on. But if you just leave everything the same and then start adding drugs, it's so complicated. There's no way to see what's going on. There's too many variables, yeah. right? Too many variables. Yeah. Oh, this is getting me thinking about uh, how addictive some of these things are. Sugar. Oh, sugar. It's oh. more addictive than anything I've Absolutely. ever. If I accidentally get a little sugar on something, I start dreaming about donuts. I go crazy too. It, it like actually like hijacks my brain. It yeah, yeah. hijacks my brain. And I, I talk about this a lot uh, with uh, with my son when I talk about mm. him. I'm like, I think about things that are going to hijack his brain. Yeah. If I give him sugar, it, he will think about that for weeks. And that yeah. will be his like main motivation. Yeah. And I'm like, that is hijacking his brain. Yeah. Too many toys. That is hijacking his brain. Like I have to, let's, let's take that away a bit. Um, mm. I have had problems with smoking in the past, not mm -hmm. entirely like, not, not horrific to any degree. The second I found out I was pregnant, I stopped smoking, never mm -hmm. touched a cigarette again. And then after um, my separation, obviously it was so challenging, I kind of got back into a little bit of it. And then I started vaping. So I'm like, oh, that'll be better for me. At mm -hmm. least it's not, you know, uh, allegedly it's, it's better for you. But then I found it was actually because the vapes will have like a raspberry flavor or a strawberry flavor or something. Yeah, that's bad. It for was your the lungs. sugar. It made it more addictive oh. than regular cigarettes huh? because of, I, first of all, I could have it when I was indoors. So it'd just be 24 seven instead of like going yes, outside. Right. And then it was actually the sugar that was addicting. I tried to go to, okay. Oh, I didn't know it had sugar in it. They, they've got sugary ones and then they've got uh, like the menthol ones. So you're, and you're vaping sugar? It's it's like a, it was the blue raspberry one. It uh -huh. It's got this candy blue raspberry yeah. taste. Yeah, oh yeah. That is so just it probably has some delicious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know and that. then it's the nicotine with the sugar. It's so much worse. Um, nicotine but it was, and sugar together at last. Uh, I quit. <laughs> I quit when I started doing the ones that had uh, none of the blue raspberry flavor. And it's like, oh, this is gross now. Huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was actually the sugar that was more addictive. Or like, yeah, it was yeah. wild. Well, I've. I don't know. The uh, whatever they put in, because I haven't tried them, because I don't have any flavor of any kind of anything. But I know that there's been lung issues that happen mm. with people because of flavored vaping. Mm. So I know that it's just what not it, good for your rest. lung. I think they call it. Oh yeah, is that what they call I mean, it? That's what I've heard. I'm, yeah. Well, I know. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a doctor either. But 
I know that uh, people have had respiratory problems from flavored yeah. vaping. Yeah, and I'm sure uh, what's crazy is it's too with like the Gen Z. I've got a few, uh, you know, family community friends that are in high school still and they've kind of told me like every single Gen Z kid, first of all, they're all using chat GPT to do their homework. No one's doing homework anymore. And this is going to be a wild change in the future, how yeah. we're going to see the way their minds work and yeah. how they do things. Just a completely different beast. You know, even... George, my son Julian, he developed yeah. something called essay.app. Mm -hmm. And in that, uh, he's developing it so that teachers can use it. They can give an assignment and they can see all the work, all the work that the kids wow. do. Wow. So if they are using chat GBT, then that they'll be able to so tell. Needed. They'll be able to tell. That's so necessary. That is yeah? so necessary. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the chat GPT is, they're using it 24 seven. And then they're also mentioning like, oh yeah, we just all go into the bathroom and vape all day. Right. They're all vaping like crazy. In the, like that in the school bathrooms. Yeah. Oh yeah. And you know, of course to they be, are. Uh, I, I, once again, I always see older generations are like, why are you guys smoking? Why do you need nicotine? You've never been through anything. You know, I used to hike. 400 miles through the snowy tundra to get to school like every everyone older than you's got a story about you know how crazy the life is i think it's more difficult to be gen z than to be some of the generations that went through some crazy stuff i think it's more difficult to have so little meaning in your life and so, and so many meaning. choices so many choices so much can, you can you can have everything you've ever wanted in your life materially but nothing spiritually and nothing structurally that yeah, you actually yeah. need brutal eh? it is the last man, you know, it is horrific consumerism and lack of, of structure. Well, the whole idea of materialism being the answer, I think we're seeing the end of, I think we're seeing the end of that with these people changing their yeah. hormones and changing their genders. Yeah. Materially, that that's not the answer. Yeah. To change yourself in a material way is, that's not the answer. And this is, this is something I've, you, it's like you're speaking to two completely different species almost when you speak to someone who views the world as a purely physical place mm -hmm. versus someone who views this as kind of a projection we're seeing in a spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is really important to me these days that I surround myself with people who see this as a spiritual yeah, me experience. Mm -hmm. um, th there's a lot of horrific ideas that can prevail if, if you see this as only a physical world mm -hmm. that are correct. A lot of horrific ideas are completely correct. If what this are you is only, thinking of? Um, well, like eugenics. These, if this is just a physical space, why aren't we trying to completely perfect the human race and create the ubermensch, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of, you know, I mean, a, a lot of things can be justified in the name of just protecting genetics and advancing genetics. That's That should be the purpose. I mean, a lot of a lot of horrific medical things that were done uh, throughout both communist, Nazi regimes, all of it, completely justified if there's no spiritual, you know, war actually going on, if there's no value or spark of the divine in each human being. Well, this whole um, BC law now that made is the way to go when people, mm. you know, that that's, I'm going to be talking to someone soon who uh, was offered made, and she's not, she's no older than me, she's maybe 60, you know, who has chronic illness, mm -hmm. instead of b having help with say, maybe a wheelchair or, you know, some other means to make her life more manageable, yeah. was offered made. And uh, this is really getting out of hand. And it's something that happened during Nazi Germany you know, yeah. that they started by cleaning up the factories, making sure there were flowers outside, making sure that the, there weren't so many uh, rodents running around in the factories. That's how it began mm -hmm. until it, they used a, ver a, a derivative of the same drug to use in the extermination camps. Mm -hmm. So we have to be, you know, what we're going down right now in that way this is this is a hurdle that we've got to really pay attention to. Gives me chills. Gives yes. me chills thinking that I'm living in this country right now. Yeah, I'll be honest. Like I, I, you know, 
I really do believe, and this is going maybe into crazy conspiracy land, but mm -hmm. like the way that North Korea, uh, how, mm. how, we're, how it's described, how North Koreans are indoctrinated and view the society they're living in. And we all look at that and we're like, wow, they're so ignorant. I think we're in the exact same, we're under the exact same spell. Well, Yaomi Parks talks about it. Yeah. Yeah, she talks about being here and being offered, you know, ideas that she would have been offered in North Korea. Yeah, and uh, it's, uh, it's through our education system, it's through our media, which is all state controlled, and we're, we might as well be living under socialism or communism. So what are you going to do with your kids <laughs> for education? Um, have you made any decisions? Waldorf schooling. Waldorf schooling? Yeah, yeah. and uh, like-minded people outside of the public schools, it's, yeah. you know, I think it's important to have peers and mm -hmm. social groups and mm -hmm. friends. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, you know, plus I I think I'm a decent teacher, but uh, yes, that's not sure my necessarily my 100% strength. And I, I think there are people that can assist in that. And definitely uh, Waldorf schooling, uh, they're, they're, I've got a wonderful community built where I am right now. And everyone's doing it how it should be, discussing, all right, can we build a school together? Can yeah. we, uh, what, what's gonna, what's it gonna look like for the kids when they're older? And obviously it depends on the state of Canada and where that's going. I, I don't even think I can get out of Canada if I wanted to, and mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't mm -hmm. if I could. I, mm -hmm. When I went to South Africa, one of the main things I asked people was, why don't you just leave? Right. Like you're getting slaughtered, what is going on? And I, you probably remember, it's like, this is where my family has farmed for 500 years. My great grandfather died here. My grandfather died here. And I'm going to die here on this soil, fighting for it and fighting for my family. And I think one of the least useful solutions given to young people is just move, uh, just go move somewhere cheaper. It's like, no, actually mm -mm. having and maintaining community. a community. Yeah. That's that you've deal. built over years and years is what creates high trust societies. You all know each other, you know your families, yeah. you know your history. Uh, that is so important for mm -hmm. safety. All the, I think things like school shootings would happen mm. less in communities where everyone knew each other better, right. greater history, right, all right. of that thing. Yeah, like good point. All, all of that kind of problems mm -hmm. would, would dissipate. So just ceding that to the globalist government cabal or like yeah sure just replace my entire community and city and i'll just move to the middle of nowhere and then my kids will move further to the middle of nowhere and we'll just move away until our entire towns and cities are destroyed that's just delusional you need to be there taking care of your family you need to have a granny flat in your yard you need to like keep it together the the people that you love and care about i'm going to be talking to my sister soon she's a palliative care nurse in mm -hmm. bc she's a retired palliative care nurse but she told me a few years ago, she said, you know, the healthcare system isn't, it, it's, it's not going to be able to take care of our elderly. Yeah. We are going to have to take care of our elderly in our homes. Yeah. That's the future of, of Canada's healthcare. Yeah. So I'm going to talk to her, I think, on the 3rd of August. We'll see what she has to say about that. Mm. But um, our healthcare system, the way that it's been set up, that we, we did an experiment, it didn't work. So it has to change, yeah. And our society has to change if we're going to take care of one another, like you yeah. said, community. And I just see that more and more. Uh, obviously, to me, it just comes back to me all the time now. Just how important community is. Yeah, absolutely. And this is also when I talk a bit about cannibalizing the uh, future generations. Um, I have a, a deep frustration with anyone who took advantage of uh, selling properties in Canada, BC particularly, to overseas buyers mm. to get the highest price possible, that to me is complete treachery to the younger generation. You have inflated the entire market, you have made it impossible for them to ever own a home, and now you won't have a home for them to take care of you in. Like it's right. <laughs> like, and it would be yeah, one thing if you were you. Yeah, mm -hmm. selling it to the younger generation or better yet, you know, building a f things used to be built like family compounds right you'd yeah. have family and extended family like all living on the same property working together living together and that made raising kids a lot easier too yes. and far more appealing yes <laughs> um so before we can even fix a lot of these problems oh the nuclear family is falling apart people aren't having kids anymore like okay well no more suggesting people move 
no more just getting maximizing profit as an incentive for any of us. Like we, there's so many things that need to be fixed. Yeah, no more telling women that career is going to be the most important yeah. thing in your life. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Because if you don't have children, you don't grow up. Or at least I've seen. It's very difficult That's to grow so up. That's so true. Oh, my goodness. How much have you grown up in the last three wow. years? Eh? Sometimes I apply my growing up to the pain I've been through, but it really is having a kid. It's giving up that selfishness. Yeah. Life isn't Wasn't about that me a relief, anymore. Eh? It's not about <laughs> me anymore. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, man. I'm a completely different person. And it's like, it's almost hard to explain to people sometimes because obviously I moved away for a bit when I became a mom. I was in Australia. Yeah. I was very isolated. It was under COVID. So I was all alone yeah, just right. being a mom by myself, mm -hmm. losing my mind and mm -hmm. only because of the situation with the governments and, and my marriage. My son was such a joy, like that bright light that kept me going forward. But uh, yeah, completely different human being. Better. Better. Better person for Yes. It. I'm not better. perfect, but I am a better person. Well, God, no. And no, none of us should claim that because then you know you're yeah. crazy. <laughs> then you know you've lost it completely. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, motherhood, it's, uh, and it's undervalued. It's undervalued, you know. Uh, we've been told, we've been led astray by this idea that career was going to be our salvation and that it was the thing that was going to be fulfilling for us because... I have, and you know, when I first was going to have my first baby, I thought, okay, am I going to stay home with my babies? And I had a dream, I had a dream that I was in my house and I went into the closet to put on my shoes and my grandmother's shoes were there and my grandmother stayed home with her kids and I put on her shoes and they were a little bit too tight. It wasn't that they didn't fit at all, but they were a little too tight. So I knew that I wasn't just going, I wasn't only going to stay at home. Mm. I, I had other things about uh, what I needed to do in life, I needed to pursue those other things too. But I really did want to stay home with my children. And it, it, my dream said, yes, you know, mm -hmm. yes, but beware because there's more, there's more to you than that. So make sure that you're, you honor those other things about you. Yeah. I, I thought, think that makes you a better mother too. Like, I love that. I, there's like this horrific, almost horseshoe theory dichotomy going on right now and talks about motherhood on the internet. You got one side that's like motherhood is slavery, it's subjugation of women, like it's going to ruin your life. And then you've got another side that says motherhood is slavery and you need to be subjugated by your husband and just be a mother and never do anything with your life. Yeah. And both of these sides are too, you know, you're both ruining it for women. Yeah. Uh, and a mother is... They're not is, complete stories, those. Oh, completely. Yeah. And in, in a, like you look at uh, traditional families in like <laughs> Greece or Italy and the, the, the matriarch is extremely important. Yeah, she runs the home Absolutely. and the community. Yes. They're extremely important. They're running like everything, for, uh, whole families, mafia families. Like, yeah. You know, they're running. <laughs> right. they're, they're important figures. Mm -hmm. And um, it's this, this weird, because a lot of the people trying to revive the past and traditionalism have never actually experienced it firsthand. They don't they're, know what it is. They're just looking mm. at Norman Rockwell photos that mm. show women mm. in like little tight dresses serving cakes to the kids right, and the right. husband and giving him a kiss on the cheek. Yeah. No, women are extremely important to the traditional family. They are the neck. The husband is the head. He's the one that's going to be making the deals, going out, you know, moving and shaking. But the woman has such wisdom and advice and guidance for the family and the, the matriarch. You don't question the, you know, the, the matriarch and the family. There's, I, I, I've seen it firsthand in some of these families I visited, certainly overseas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the weird LARP version, LARP being live action role play version of traditionalism we've created on the internet today where people are making TikTok videos of baking muffins is... I, it's going to completely fall apart. It's going to, I think, destroy a lot of uh, the conservative movement, unfortunately, because I don't think you can live action role play a relationship. It has to be a genuine partnership and teamwork where you trust and respect each other and one person is not subjugated. Mm -hmm. Being a support role does not mean subjugation at all. If anything, the support role is equally important and significant to whoever is in the leadership role. No, oh, yeah, Jane <laughs> says, you know, sometimes he goes out, he goes out, when he comes home, he's coming home thinking, I can relax there. 
I, I will be, I'll be loved there. Mm -hmm. This is a place where I can relax, I can rejuvenate, I can enjoy, and then I can go back out to do difficult things. Yeah. And so that, that's what home is. And because women have left the home in their communities, now you look at that movie, The Birth Gap, and you see how many places are childless in mm. the world. And women have to think really, really hard about this because we've left our homes and we've left our communities. And when you leave your home and your community, then they don't exist anymore. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Shouldn't stop there. <laughs> Sorry, it's like <laughs> you've given me there. so many new thoughts to think about and I like to process them before <laughs> talking about them. Wow. I think, you know, to be the person that I needed to be today, I needed to go and have all my adventures yeah, and explore I think you did the world. Too. Yeah. But uh, there's no denying that it hits you when you're older. Um, there's no denying that, because uh, I, I, uh, I went out and explored the world the way a man should, you know, the way a man should have his adventures. I went out to Morocco. I was getting arrested at gunpoint on the Turkish Jeez. border. You know, I've been in questioning <laughs> sessions with the police and running around in riots. I've, I've explored the world the way a man should. And as I've gotten older and a little wiser looking back on my experiences, I wouldn't take a single thing back for the world. And I wouldn't say that necessarily every woman needs to avoid this. There are some that are going to uh, need it or want to pursue that in their life. But it, the, there is a lot of actual trauma that has come with that later on in life. A lot of uh, defenses and, you know, more difficulty getting into my feminine energy that I probably wouldn't have had difficulty with had I stayed at home with my community where I was very safe. And a lot of looking back and realizing how much danger I was actually in mm -hmm. and how naive I was thinking that I as a woman with blonde hair half the way to some of the people that I was surrounding myself with that I didn't know that were outside my community that could have been completely lying to me. Um, I did not have any awareness of the danger I was actually putting myself in and how horribly wrong my entire life could have gone at any one of those moments. And uh, I'm very lucky, but um, there is, yeah, staying around your community, your family, the people you trust that are your teammates, whether you're a man or a woman is crucially important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we had no idea, right? We had no yeah. idea that that was the case. Yeah. We all thought it was all about getting out and going places. Well, I think there's also this, this stupid, <laughs> very silly idea in liberalism that we're taught in high school that everyone kind of thinks the same. We're all very, and there right, is, right. We, we all have similar motivations, I think. We all have the divine spark in us. We all have the ability to think similarly. But uh, man, when people are raised with different childhoods than your own, with different values, different politics, uh, different normalcy, uh, like you have people that uh, come in to to Canada as, as immigrants and um, they've come from a country where they've grown up around murder and crime and all these things as a norm. They've seen dead bodies multiple times. They've had, uh, and, and that's going to be more of a norm in their life and more of a normal reaction <laughs> than uh, the childhood that I grew up with and vice versa when I go to different countries. And it will literally, you can kind of, because so much of our social interactions definitely in Canada are social niceties. Mm -hmm. You can kind of feign that there's this connection and we're all on the same page when it's not at all. That's just like the surface level, same page. There's mm -hmm. a lot going on underneath culturally that is completely different. And did you see Sound of Fury or did you Sound, Sound of, freedom? of Freedom? I need to see that. We're going to, I've got a, uh, my church, I think are going to be doing a uh, showing of it. I oh, haven't, yeah. I, I need to go to church again. I, I, after I published my video about my marriage, I've kind of just socially isolated to mentally recover. <laughs> I need to, I need to get back into my community right now. But yeah, I think they're doing a showing of it that I'm probably gonna. Yeah, you'll see. have to see it. I saw it. We always saw it because Jordan was going to do a podcast. He did a podcast with the um, hmm. the um, undercover. Um, Tim Ballard and the star of the show mm. Jim the star of the show and I cried through that whole podcast when I saw it they are so brave those two men so brave I feel like because I have a kid it's gonna be really hard to watch I think it will be 
But yeah. well, wow. I'm sure your community will all watch it together and that'll be better. That's another thing I feel like is so... Ooh. That wouldn't be happening if there were homes and communities. That wouldn't be happening. You, I think you said that maybe at the yeah. beginning. Yeah, uh, with school shootings, all of that, people would really understand yeah. people's proclivities and how they behaved. And um, in fact, the what, what was the largest mass shooting in Canada? Was it the Halifax? I can't remember where exactly it was. I'm it not was sure. in the last ten years. Anyways. Uh, there were multiple people that had moved from that community before the shooting happened because they knew that the guy was going to do mm, this. Mm, and mm, that's the, mm, mm, right? There's mm. like an understanding of who the people are around you. Yeah. Um, but this is another thing with the whole child sex trafficking and pedophilia. When I was 18 years old, I did 17, 18. I did a protest where I held a sign that says, there's no rape culture in the West at a feminist protest. And I was saying that because uh, I'm a little autistic sometimes. I, I don't know if I'm on the spectrum or not, but I really think about things it, like very literally. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, literally, we do not have a culture that promotes rape. Like our media doesn't promote it. Our mm -hmm. government doesn't promote it, this and that. And in my literal mind, it, it seemed completely hysterical and ridiculous to say. And looking back, while I still think running around naked and screaming these things is extremely unhelpful and silly of uh, the feminist movement to do, there is an aspect of I do think there's a bit of an undercover rape culture that exists because so many people are, I do believe there's way more child sex trafficking, way more molestation, all of these things happening then, to young people than yeah. is ever reported. Yeah, um, looks that way. Because it's so, especially in the 90s and early 2000s, where it's like, what are you going to do to prove it? What are you going to, and then, then, even if it doesn't happen to the next generation, there, you've got someone who has that trauma in their life that's informing their decision making, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. affecting them. And that, I also, this is probably pretty lefty of me, but I absolutely believe in uh, generational trauma mm. affecting the next, you know, the, the future going forward. Well, they know and that through epigenetics now, yeah. that, that trauma is uh, passed through the genetic code. Wow. Well, you know, say something, say there's somewhere that your people have gone where, say there's, I don't know, there's a place where there's wild animals and mm -hmm. that genetically, you, you might know that this over here is a place you shouldn't go. Mm, and that, really and that would be necessary. So you can see why it's necessary. And now that's proven that it's true. And the, the more time in my life I've spent, like having real conversations with real people, you almost don't know who someone is unless you've spoken to them at 3 a.m. when yeah. they're like drunk <laughs> or something. That's right. That's like, it, then you get to really see the raw individual. So many people I know have these stories of when they were kids being assaulted that they're like, no, I could never report it. That especially men mm. and boys. Mm. There was a uh, rapist in the UK. I, sorry, I don't know if I can say that on YouTube. Um, Oh, his name started with an S. Uh, he was a Asian lad. Anyways, he was a gay man that went out to bars and he was a predator against young British boys and he would bring them back and drug them. And mm. uh, he got through, I think it was over 200 men that he had assaulted before he was caught. And even what he taped all of these horrific acts he did. And even when the police would bring the footage to these men and show them, mm -hmm this is you being sexually assaulted, the men would say, nope, it's not me. Oh, I it's see. It's not me. So right. this is what made it so hard to catch this guy oh. is because uh, none of the men wanted to be seen as the victim. Mm -hmm. They all were like, nope, that is not me. And I, you know, that's, I don't blame them. Many of them were mocked horrifically mm -hmm. if they did come out mm -hmm. on Twitter, like just people trying to destroy their entire reputation for being a victim of this crime. And, uh, I think that happens with a lot of people with the child sex trafficking stuff. Who's going to believe me? This sounds like insane conspiracy stuff. I don't have the proof now. And so it perpetuates and perpetuates and perpetuates. And especially in places like Hollywood and these cesspits where people are so powerful and have so much money and lawyers. And it's, it's horrific. Well, I, I just didn't, I just never thought of, I, <laughs> I never thought of a child in financial terms before and what a child would be worth on the market. I never, I, I just never let myself go there and think about it. But when I watched this film, I realized that like how much a, a life is worth because you can rent it over and over and over and over again. You know, you can buy a diamond once. I mean, you could resell it. But a live person, 
you that's just something that can go on forever so there was so much yeah so it's really important that we all and people like pay attention to, to this people like to pretend it's not happening because it's mm. so dark it's, it's so, dark. so dark that it's just easier to think this is a conspiracy and, it, and that's an evil in itself to refuse to see evil for what it is yes that's and for sure we're seeing this from hollywood new york times media all saying this is a horrible conspiracy film that people shouldn't yeah, pay attention right. to qn and nonsense it's yeah, like yeah. oh what do you have to hide yeah uh, you're, you're <laughs> awfully scared yeah I think. yeah yeah what's yeah. going on there yeah. um but yeah, it's there, there are even things I have seen in my life that I don't talk about sometimes because I don't have the proof for them and they're almost so dark and so evil. I don't want to think of, I, when I was doing my borderless film, I had a staff member, I had a few people that I had hired from overseas that were like living in the countries, you know, Turkey, Morocco, that to help out. And one of them um, was working on uh, ending some of the human uh, trafficking because what would happen with a lot of immigration, and this is a big problem with mass immigration that the government never seemed to be willing to address or talk about, just refugees welcome, come on in, yeah. wh whether it's an official process or not, that's well uh, observed. Uh, because you've got all these people that are destroying their passports so they won't be deported coming over borders, you can just disappear them easy, yes. easy peasy, and no one's gonna know where they are. Oh, mm -hmm. they got lost in the jungle on the way, they drowned, this, that. So a lot of these children were being taken for uh, organs. A lot yes. of the kids trying to come over the Turkish border and he had videos of these kids having their organs cut out on oh tables, God. like being killed. It was like horrific. And this is happening right now. And it's like, it's, it's, people are too comfortable. They're too comfortable with not knowing, with not closing, knowing. Yeah, yeah, with not paying attention. Yeah. And I think about this now, especially now that I have a kid, I uh, think yeah. about all of this all the time. And it's in, and that messes you up too when you've kind of seen the darkness that the world has and you have a kid and you know you're going to have to prepare them to face this darkness in the world. Yeah. And it's uh, just, but it's overwhelming. But you know, facing it, facing it, you face that voluntarily. Mm -hmm. If you face it involuntarily, it's very traumatizing. But if you face yeah. it voluntarily, then you can you can deal with it. And so that's why we have to look at this voluntarily. It's mm. a lot easier wow, on you point. to look at it volunt voluntarily. You hide from it, you try not to see it, and then it happens, that's when you're traumatized. Wow, that's right? a really great point. Yeah. Oh, I, I wish I could remember what the book was called, but there, there's been a few books written on this about how they're, you know, children that are raised within tribes where their father hunted, you know, they hunt and then their son will hunt. They have a lot better time dealing with trauma because there's a collective understanding of death, of yes. violence, of these yes. kind of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they talked about this with World War II veterans because so many people had experienced it. There was, obviously they'd have all these meetings together. They'd all go out to uh, bars and, and be able to talk about what they experience with others. Whereas right. when there's more niche wars or niche experiences, it tends to be that the PTSD is, is worse, especially with modern soldiers, because there's less of a collective understanding of violence. In fact, uh, most people for most of their life will never even see a dead body, yeah. let alone the actual act of violence happening. It's covered up and quickly pushed away out of, out of sight. Yeah. And when they do, they're rubbernecking so hard because they've never seen anything like it. And uh, the, the people who have seen and understand the darkness and violence in the world versus those who haven't, it's just such a cataclysmic difference of, of understanding that when someone does, the, the PTSD they experience is like a thousand times over, I think, because yeah. no well, one, they the can't PTSD even begin to explain it. The victim is somebody who, who doesn't think that they have that in them. They don't think they have that darkness in them, that, that, that they could do those things. And then they find out they could do those things, and it's too much for them. Because their whole uh, idea of who they were didn't encompass that. And, mm. you know, it's funny, when I started this podcast, I thought, well, I would start um, talking about the rosary. That's what I wanted to do at the beginning. And so I did a few episodes just talking about the meaning of the rosary because I was praying the rosary. But then I thought, well, I'm doing a podcast about the divine feminine. So then I'm thinking about the divine feminine. And then I started thinking about it and I thought, oh, oh, that's going to go as good as it will go. It's also going to go that far to the horrors, yeah. to the horrors. And what is, what are the horrors 
to the divine feminine. That's mm. anything. That's anything biological, because we make life, women, right? Yeah. And so anything that has to do with pedophilia and child trafficking and all of that. Those those are all. That's the divine. That's the dark side of the divine feminine. I thought, oh dear, I'm going to have to. I'm going yeah. to have to talk about these things. It, but it made it voluntary. Yeah. So it's doable, but gives, it's not pleasant. Gives me chills and it makes me happy that you're doing that. That wow, I've never heard it explained as, as if you voluntarily do it, that prepares you. And yes, I think it that's does. where some of the biggest disappointment in, in my life came from was the naivety being overwhelmed by reality. That was always the biggest points of trauma in yes, my life. Yes, right, right. So no, feeling yeah. unprepared yeah. for reality. And I, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, I, I look at uh, how I was raised when I was younger and I have so much respect and love for, for my parents and the way that they raised me. But um, I, I was raised in such a uh, evangelical community and um, my, my capacity for understanding evil and how people could act was so childish, childlike. Mm, mm. And uh, you always want to protect that childlike wonder for as long as you can while, while it's still a useful thing in a kid's life. But um, yeah, I, I really went out into the world you thinking really did. every single person was telling the truth to me for the uh -huh, most part. Right. And that just broke my brain. And it made mm. me a bad person because I started to think that I guess this is just normal or okay like people mm. don't <laughs> you know mm. um, that everyone was like that yeah, everyone's just like this yeah the, yeah the yeah that's so true it's the naivety which i guess how did you talk to your kids about darkness for the first time and kind well of evil i in had the world? jordan in mm. the family yeah jordan there you go darkness. <laughs> <laughs> i go around your house the first time i came over there when i was like 19 and you guys had all the communists you know mm -hmm. paintings and port I think oh. in the porch there were the it was the uh ukrainians being shot wow back in the 20s it's like oh, God, as soon as you walked in our front door yeah so that wasn't hard it was it was there mm. and of course michaela became very ill very mm. young so there was that there was that darkness too that came into our family uh, and our kids lives very so they had to learn what it's like to work to live through adversity mm -hmm. pretty young in life so interesting yeah and you know those things i can even remember when we moved from boston we had a pretty idyllic life there michaela wasn't ill or that we knew of she was but we weren't aware of it and uh we were going to move to toronto and it was hard because Michaela had gone to kindergarten and she was had friends and I had taken care of kids because I couldn't work. So I just brought kids into the house and took care of them there and we, they played. And then we were moving to Toronto and the kids were worried and we were worried about them. But that was a big transformation for them at five and six years old. And then we bought a house. So they moved from like one community in Toronto to another one at about year seven and eight. And then when they left uh, elementary school, all their neighborhood kids went to this one school. But Michaela, she just went to whatever school she wanted to because she had learned by then that she could make friends again. Mm. So, th so although we had to move and make new friends, there's something to that too. If you do that voluntarily, you can recover again and, and you learn how. You know, it would be better to just stay in that community at the beginning and to grow with that community and grow with those children and, and you know, just share and depend on one another like that. That would be ideal. But if you have to move, people, we are resilient, right? We yes. can learn, but we have to realize that that's not ideal, right? That's not ideal. The ideal would be that community that you started with and to have it always a place you could return to. Yeah, that would be ideal. No, absolutely, absolutely. Hmm. I, I always look back with with fondness on like the younger the friend circles I had as a kid. Yeah. When when you could w just walk to your friend's house and knock on the door and you yeah. weren't texting them constantly or you had to memorize everyone's phone number to call them. I think a lot of the healing of the world is going to come if we have a bit more of a return to analog. If we have more yeah. distrust of our technology and and uh, yeah, because right. it necessitates. Uh, 
being around those around you and, and yeah. it, it necessitates being kind and better to the people in your direct community yes. because there's nowhere else to run. No, <laughs> you, know? you know, if you say something rude to someone, they're going to respond. <laughs> and it also necessitates, this is something I've had trouble with lately is uh, especially just because I'm going through quite a big healing period after releasing my video. Uh, I can be flaky sometimes because I'm like, I just need my 13 years in the desert to reevaluate my life. <laughs> um, but uh, my, my professor, Ron Dart, he uh, doesn't have a cell phone. So when we agree to go for a walk and have a coffee, you better show up. Right, oh, right, right. There's they're no showing way. up there too, and there's no way you can cancel. There's nothing you can do. You yeah. gotta, you gotta yeah. stick to your word. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, there's a lot of beautiful things. I've been watching uh, this cabin that I'm in right now. Mm -hmm. It's full of VHSs, and I've been watching mm -hmm. all my movies on VHS. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's something magical about it. I enjoy them more. Yeah. I can't. I, I I can't explain it. I really can't. There's something about the way they're filmed, the graininess, the ads at the beginning, the <laughs> the inability to pause it, having to rewind it for <laughs> right. five, 10 minutes. There's, uh, sometimes, I guess when things take more effort, sometimes you just enjoy them more. Yeah. When everything's well, instant. Yeah, it's, yeah, I think so. When everything's instant, it's superficial. Yeah. There's a superficial part of it, right? And then yeah. you don't pay attention to the point. And what is attention? I've been thinking about mm. what is attention? Because kids will do anything for attention, right? Mm -hmm. And if you don't give them proper attention, they'll start to misbehave because yes. they'll say, well, will this work or will that work? Yeah. How about if I jump off the, you know, the, the desk to the floor? Uh, what do I have to do? Do I have to upend the furniture? Like, what yeah, do I have yeah. to do to get attention? Because attention is love. I mm. think attention is love. And so the m kids will do anything for attention because they'll do anything for love. Mm. And so attention is love. So you give your kids attention, the attention that they need, not any kind of attention, but attention that is challenging, loving but challenging, right? So that they're awake and, mm. yeah. It's, uh, yeah, really listening and really hearing yeah. someone and really trying to understand them. This is something I didn't master until after I had a kid, I think. I, I had a genuine desire to understand everyone I met, but, uh, I didn't understand what went into understanding, uh -huh. <laughs> if that makes sense. And I think that's why a lot of people really like to silo themselves into certain political groups, certain religious blocks, whatever it is. And I, I find it so fascinating analyzing uh, how much Jordan dislikes being asked if he's a Christian, mm -hmm. because so often, I, may, you'll have to correct me, but it seems like one of his main frustrations, maybe one, uh, the people don't really care about the state of his soul. They just want to know he's on their side. Mm -hmm. And two, it's not even for him. It's for their own comfort so that they know the that's way that... What, that's what he thinks, I think, yeah. is, is that uh, they're hoping that they can be the person who gets Jordan Peterson to say, because then it's, yeah. it's them. It's about them. It's, it's, and it's then not it's about him. also a reaffirmation that, okay, this person who is very intelligent and a lot of people look up to agrees with my worldview. They're, therefore, I feel more comfortable and more stable in my view of the world. Yeah. Because everyone wants to feel comfortable in their view of the world. It's a very discombobulating thing to mm -hmm. not, realize yeah. you were wrong mm -hmm. about your entire structure <laughs> of reality. Right, right, right. Um, so everyone likes to silo themselves into these groups so that they don't have to really, uh, really reckon with another soul really consider do how do work. you see the world? Why do you see the world that way? How could you see it better? How could I put myself in your shoes and see how you, I'm at a point in my life that's uh, so strange and terrifying where like I can look at someone who's joined Antifa and like cut off their boobs and everything and be like, okay, I, I can see the line of thought that would get you there. I can understand, I can actually sympathize. I, I don't think it's correct and I don't think it's making you happier, but I can actually see a life where a certain series of events could happen to me that would make me make the same decisions that that person did. Hmm. And um, yeah, being able to really, really listen. Oh, it's such a challenging skill, but so worthwhile in the relationships you can create with it. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And they yeah. don't necessarily have to be people that have the same politics or have the same uh, religious, all these things. And this is something C.S. Lewis talks about a lot. He's like, mm -hmm. I know, I know people who call themselves Christians that couldn't be further away from it and people that will never use the Christian label that are closer to God than 
most I know who do. And uh, it, it's really about exploring the state of the soul. Yeah, listening to one another, listening, yeah. listening, giving and giving attention. I think yeah. are key to uh, communication, key key to uh, finding out that maybe something you believe is inaccurate. Mm. Right, and you maybe you didn't even know you believed it, because mm -hmm. maybe someone gave you that belief in the beginning, and you've just been believing it because well, that's who that's you a are. Given. Yeah. That's just what reality and, was set as. But if you listen, yeah. <laughs> if you listen, and really listen, and not say anything, and not think about the next thing you want to say, but just listen, then you might hear something that changes a belief and updates who you are, and gives you a bigger, broader world. Mm. Right, and we don't do that much anymore. I think people have forgotten how to, they don't listen, and they, they and they go, don't negotiate. Right, there's no negotiation. There's I'm right, and this person is like I'm right, and there's no, you, there's no letting go of what they believe in and listening, and updating, and then so there's no sense of play, mm. right? Because when you negotiate completely with each other, so you find a place where you understand one another, then you can play. Yes, exactly. And th this is another thing I see, uh, uh, this is why precise language is so important. And obviously mm. uh, Jordan's been a big uh, adherent to, we gotta be precise with our language. Uh, I'll watch people, and I've had this in my own life too, where I'm trying to get to that point of play, I'm trying to get to that point of, like we're really like talking in unison, but there are literal, there are words we'll use that mean entirely different things mm -hmm. to us because they've become so vague, so non-defined. What does love mean? What does family mean? What does commitment mean? What the, like, mm -hmm. to me, like marriage. Marriage to me is, that's for life. Uh, you're not doing nothing else but <laughs> sticking with this person. Obviously that word meant something different to my husband. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. I, di I didn't, maybe I didn't ask enough questions. Maybe there wasn't, you know, but clearly that was a word that we needed to understand, mm -hmm. that we had the same agreement on the definition. And everyone's out here having fights. Sometimes sometimes they're even agreeing on the same thing, but the words they're saying mean different things to each individual person. Yeah. The precision of language is just so important. Oh yeah, often so important. Jordan and I are, are uh, arguing about something. We find out that we just didn't understand what each other is saying. I mean, I, yeah. almost like 99% of the yeah. time, that's what it is. It isn't that we disagree, it's that we misunderstand. Yeah. <laughs> right? And I, yeah, yeah. Also that trying to think of your response before the other yeah. person finishes talking. I struggle with that so much. I have to <laughs> actively fight it and like really be active with my listening because of the, I, obviously the last 10 years since I was a kid, I grew up in media. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to be caught on your back foot, right. and on, especially live TV or something. Right. Like, Oh, you've given me something to think about. Let me just sit here. No, <laughs> you're never going to be invited on that show again. You can't just sit there. You better have something to say. Yeah, <laughs> Even right. if you change the topic entirely. Yeah. It's uh, really the cameras. I, I know there's a uh, great irony to talking about all this with cameras on us right now, but there is something that really kills our, our ability to have genuine understanding when there's cameras around. And yeah. That take that takes uh, that takes some trust in yeah. yourself that you'll be able to have something to say. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just this. Oh, think. Uh, uh, yeah. And most most people are hiding aspects of them. I'm hiding aspects of myself that I don't want the internet to know about. I've, mm -hmm. I've talked a lot about. We're well, a pretty public person. It's no yeah. wonder. Yeah. I I've talked. I, I reckon a lot more than most <laughs> political figures about my personal life and the struggles I've had. But most people. Uh, we, we've all lived through things that we're embarrassed by. We've all lived through things that we've changed our mind on. And mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. when you become established as a figure on the internet and, and as a set of expectations from the audience of what ideas you're going to purport, I've watched people literally stop the growth of their mind and their soul for a decade for the sake of their audience for the sake of the camera and it's uh yeah i've done that myself at times i've completely stopped my growth and my ability to mm -hmm. communicate with others because that's very inconvenient for what it's going to look like when it gets uploaded to the internet right and so there's very very few even the honest conversations that happen 
are so rare on the internet and you're never going to get that 3 a.m. conversation you have with someone over a beer mm -hmm. where they're bawling their eyes out and telling you how they really feel about the world. Mm -hmm. You're just not going to get that online. <laughs> no, not yeah. often. Maybe not now often. And then. Now Maybe and then. now and then. But you can get close. This is a very nice conversation. I'm very oh, much liking good. this conversation. Oh, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I was looking forward to having you here. Yeah. It was good of you to come. I'm glad I did. I oh, that's good. Yay. It took a lot, but uh, I'm glad I, yeah, there was something that told me, no, this is actually going to be a really meaningful interview. <laughs> well, we've been trying to do this for so long. Yeah. I start to thinking, hmm, is this supposed to happen? Uh, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm open to wondering whether it's supposed to happen mm. or not. They're very true. Until it happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But it's good. Mm. So thanks very much. Thank you for having me. This has been lovely. Yeah. I thought, I think we discussed some things that'll be good to listen to. Uh, I appreciate you coming on and um, I look forward to the next time that we meet. Absolutely. Thanks, Tammy. You're welcome. Mm -hmm.